Hello, Diet Soap listeners and viewers. It's me again, Douglas Lane. And in this short found footage documentary, I'll be re-examining Naomi Klein's 1999 book, No Logo, assessing her argument against multinational corporations and neoliberalism 22 years later. Are we facing different problems in this post-Trump COVID era? Should the left, in the face of a seemingly growing nationalist reaction, forget the anti-globalization sentiments that defined its most radical tendencies in the 90s and early zero years? Is it time for the socialist left to defend neoliberalism? Before I explain why the answer is no, I want to disclose that the question of logos and brands is not just of academic concern for me. The power of brands was one of the reasons, amongst a number, that I ended up leaving the old channel and relinquishing all legal claims to it. Uncontracted freelancers retain the rights to what they create in most cases. But this time, it was simpler and more reasonable to just let go. To put it simply, the power of brands is particularly irksome to me at the moment, but that personal motivation just means that I have to be even more careful than is usual as I examine Klein's old book and the question of multinational companies and their brands once again. So putting aside my sudden dislike for brands, let's take a look at Klein's main arguments. According to Klein, branding and brands became detached from products from commodities in the 1980s. As Fordism died, as a compact between capital and workers was broken, in the aftermath of the recession of the 70s, branding became more and more important. Quote, with the new multinational companies produced primarily were not things, but images of their brands. However, before the power of the brand image could become dominant, a mass market had to develop. If you enjoy these videos, you should click on the subscribe button and click that bell. You should also consider supporting me on Patreon. Patrons get access to a second behind the scenes parrot room discussion where we dish out gossip or go into the weeds on topics such as the tendency of the rate of profit to decline, imperialism, and the critical theories of Tiffany Percet and Donald Most. You'll also get access to both the public and private version of the revised Pop the Left series with Ashley Frawley and Pascal Robert, and the new Zoomer Philosophy series. Your support will not only make content like this possible, it will also help to establish a new publishing venture through Diet Soap Media. Right now, supporting me on Patreon will make a big difference. In the 19th century, Branding arose precisely because factory production dominated earlier forms of manufacturing. When the staples of everyday life were being produced in a uniform manner, when the markets were flooded with identical consumer goods, competitive branding became a necessity. In order to compete, companies had to differentiate themselves from each other. But this was more and more difficult to accomplish through reference to the products themselves. Quote, Within a context of manufactured sameness, image-based difference had to be manufactured along with the product." End quote. After the Reagan era, it seemed as though all of life could be captured and then turned into advertising. There was a sense that really lived experience had been replaced by TV. Your personal life, when functioning, was nothing more than an advertisement for AT&T. Your eccentric sense of fun was an ad for Sprite, and your intelligence and sense of rebellion were adverts for Apple computers. Klein's perspective on brands and branding is two-sided. On the one hand, she laments the way consumer society had overcome opposing ideologies. 
our conceptions of democracy, of freedom, of sexuality and beauty, even our idea of spirituality, had been taken up by marketing people, not merely in order to sell a product, but in order to create a brand image that could be attached to a myriad of mass-produced objects. Victoria's Secret, as a brand, isn't just about lingerie, but as a label that can be used to sell soap, perfume, lotions, makeup, slippers, handbags, swimwear, and so on. Coca-Cola isn't just about soda pop, but can be used to sell rugby shirts, pajamas, toys, sunglasses, and at least one video game. On the other hand, Klein examined the brand as an economic tool aligned with financial capital, as against productive capital. In the world before the new branding, capitalism had been a system of production, but during the 80s, the new multinational companies emerged. For these companies, the ostensible product was more filler for the real production, the brand. Coca-Cola has the taste you never get tired of. Always refreshing. That's why things go better with Coke after Coke after Coke. Quite a lot of Klein's book is dedicated to her Gen X disdain for marketing, which paradoxically means that large sections of the book function as a nostalgic tour through forgotten mass media spectacles. For instance, the few paragraphs she spends on the VH1 series pop-up video make me long for yesterday's nostalgia and the sense of doom that attached itself to the coming of the year 2000. Living in the grip of the pandemic, living in this post-Trump moment, the idea of the Y2K bug bringing down the globe's electrical system, causing airplanes to fall from the sky, and sending us all out into the deserts of the real in a scene reminiscent of a Mad Max film, is quite comforting. But what Naomi Klein also argued was that the rise of the brand is a symptom of the strength of monopoly capitalism. Whereas it is clear today that the power of the brand can appear strong, even as the productive economy is weak. What's more, this apparent strength is an ideological screen against the decline of capital's reproductive power, generally. Brands can increase in power, certain companies can see astronomical growth and profitability, even as the overall economy declines. But the reverse is also true. A few monopolies can enjoy massive growth, even as the overall economy is undergoing a boom. After all, it was during the post-war boom that brand management as we know it emerged. The tide was already turning against product-based companies and toward image and brand-based companies well before the neoliberal turn took hold. We noticed that uh, you bought Tide in your shopping today. Is that your regular brand? It is. I tried others, and I've always gone back to Tide. Does he go out and get himself pretty dirty? Yes. So do his brothers. In 1984, 15 years before Klein's book helped to define the anti-globalization movement, Patricia Arega published an essay entitled On Advertising, a Marxist Critique in the journal Media, Culture, and Society. In her essay, she noted that post-Marxists like Paul Sweezy argued that advertising and branding created barriers to competition in the market. Marx himself did not argue that competition was limited by monopoly capital, but rather that competition occurred within the realms of circulation and production both, and that competition should not be thought of as being expressed solely in terms of prices. Patricia Arriga wrote, competition therefore is not determined by the number of competing capitals and is not eliminated nor reduced if the number of competing firms decreases. There is no perfect or imperfect competition. Competition is a lasting fight that cuts through all the spheres of economic life. In the Marxian system, competition is not only an equilibrating force, but also a force that produces disequilibrium. Thus, the centers of gravity for prices, profits, and values are changing averages, permanent fluctuations being the normal state of the economy. Nonetheless, while Arrigo disagrees with one of the arguments in Klein's book, namely that the branding of the world is limiting market competition and that the reining in of multinational corporations by activists and states could help to overcome rising levels of unemployment and more especially underemployment, uh, problems that defined life for the then still youthful Generation X, 
she does agree that the privatization of expenditures on mass media, the funding of mass culture by advertisers, has a significant cultural effect. Klein argues that advertisers place limits on what can be said and that brands stifle creative expression and understanding. One of the examples Klein gives in this direction involves the art band Negative Land, their single called U2. That's the letter U and the numeral two. The four-man band features Adam Clayton on bass, Larry Mullen on drums, Dave Evans, nicknamed The Edge, on... This is bullshit. Nobody cares. These guys are from England, and who gives a shit? Oh, yeah. Just a lot of wasted names that don't mean diddly shit. I for sure. You don't know where you that so shit about This is bullshit. This is bullshit. Sounds like It was, only, it was in 1991 that uh, we finally uh, stepped on the wrong big toe. But the, the final thing that really brought it to the attention of Island Records that really made them decide to nail our asses was that we, we ended up uh, making the, the record look like this. <laughs> and um, we thought, this, is, this would be funny. Uh, it's, it's confusing. It looks like a, a new album from U2 that's called Negative Land. And, and we liked the idea that you put this in a record store and people are confused. We like the idea of creating this, this at the moment of consumption. Uh, you're, 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 you're not quite sure what's going on here. It was the way Negative Land borrowed U2's brand identity, more than the way Negative Land used the music of U2, that caused the band trouble. They were sued by Island Records, copies of the LP were removed from stores, and Negative Land's own record label, SST, also took them to court. Nick Land's music aims at critically engaging with mass culture, and it would be easy to take how a mainstream pop label used the courts and copyright law to squash their project as a vindication of Negative Land's radical ambition and of their uh, radical interpretation of the world. But from a Marxist perspective, the rise of brands and advertising are both merely symptoms of a concentration of capital. Unfortunately, this concentration is both economic and ideological. The commodification of more and more of our culture, while regrettable, is not the cause of economic crises, not even for the working classes. Even the precarity that smaller brands rely upon in order to function in industries with tiny profit margins, even the expansion of branding through social media, have we each and every one of us become our own brand, are not causes for our disorder but we are less able to think critically and develop a revolutionary culture or cultures because of how capital functions to mediate culture and ideas. If a branded world is one with built-in limits on our imaginations, it is also true that these limits are reproduced every day, not through mere clicks or even through consumer spending, but by a working class that has not yet come together to organize politically in its own interest. Still, hope is not to be found amongst collage artists, nor through the adoption of Gen X rebelliousness, but through the development of a change in how we produce and reproduce our lives. At the outset, I asked if the left needed to embrace neoliberalism to defend it in order to stave off a nationalist reaction that, even after Trump, is still threatening to dominate our politics. The answer is that we do not. But we also cannot merely return to the 90s, championing small-scale industries as against multinationals, concerning ourselves with empowering and expanding the welfare state while simultaneously feigning concern about market competition, hoping that we can break away from the perpetual crisis if we manage to jam the culture. All of that has to be rejected as well. On the Negative Land album JamCon 84, cultural commentator Crosley Bendix claimed that as awareness of how the media environment we occupy affects and directs our inner life grows. Some resist. However, nearly 40 years later, I can't help but notice that resistance can provide traction for the acceleration of capitalist culture. That a certain kind of resistance only deepens the hold of capital. It would be easy for me, after this recent debacle, to embrace the idea that opposing corporate logos and the power of the big monopolies is radical even socialist. Truth is, truly radical activity lies elsewhere. <laughs>